Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. This is the ninth and final talk of our lecture series on the building blocks on capitalism. We have learned about and discussed a variety of topics. Some of them could be conceived as different aspects of the same thing. Others seem to contradict one another. This is what makes the social sciences so much more difficult than the natural ones, because it isn't easy to develop a common understanding or even non-competing understandings of the phenomena we want to inquire. In this series of lectures alone, the word capitalism meant very different things. In my own talk, for example, capitalism was con considered a certain set of social practices associated with capital accumulation which is in great distance from those who define capitalism as a system consisting of certain institutions. Institutions which evolved in the 18th century, Central Europe, and later shaped the economic systems almost all over the world in their image. Others more or less identified capitalism with modern market economies, or, again very different, with societies driven by the universal pursuit of profit. It is not uncommon in the sociological discourse to ignore such conceptual differences and to focus on empirical descriptions, pretending that these descriptions were in no way shaped by the, by the concepts brought to use. This strategy of mutual non-aggression between different theoretical frameworks has two major advantages. First of all, it is a strategy that avoids attacking groups within your scientific community you might have to work with in the near future of your career. Secondly, you can keep papers and books much shorter in case you could cut out the part where you try to defend your own conceptual framework against competing ones. My remark might be regarded as a cynical exaggeration, but it is true nevertheless. Avoiding theoretical competition and controversy, however, is not the way we perform sociological research at this institute. And it is definitely not the way our guest thinks and writes. Dave Elder West has participated in and initiated several important debates in recent social theory. Among other things, he offered a realist approach to constructivism, discussed the nature of social entities, institutions, and structures as at length, reasoned about the fabric of culture and norms, and executed a huge impact on debates concerning causality and the social sphere. Two of Dave Eldavest's major contributions are these books. Both published by Cambridge University Press, The Causal Power of Social Structures from 2010, and the reality, of social con the reality of Social Construction from 2012. You find a snapshot of the wealth of work he has published on these and many other topics on the yellow sheets of paper. After his graduation in the social and political theory, Dave Elder West left the social sciences for some years of entrepreneurial experience, taking a leading position in the IT sector. This is what the digital economy was called some years ago. Fortunately, he returned to our scientific community, got his PhD at Birkbeck College, University of London, and spent some years at a British, as a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Sociology at the University of Essex. Today, he is professor for sociology at the Loughborough University <laughs> in Great Britain. And I'd like to highlight that Dave Elavest is a public sociologist too actively discussing his, theor his theories and observations in web blogs and other social media. And with this attitude, he represents, at least to my personal opinion, a scientific culture of accessibility, openness, and fruitful competitive interchange, which any sociologist should consider as a possible model for her or himself. More recently, Dave Elavest transferred his expertise in social ontology to the field of the political economy. Today, he is not only a renowned expert of social theory in general, but an expert on the theories of capitalism in the age of the digital economy as well. His latest book, 
profit and gift in the digital economy is a major contribution to the empirical sociology of digitalized value chains and it offers an extraordinary and innovative account of digital and non-digital forms of capitalism. Within this approach, Dave Elavez is basically concerned with borders. That is, with some of the more fundamental concepts, dis conceptual distinctions we tend to apply whenever chopping the real world into analyzable pieces. This perspective perfectly fits into topics and dealings of previous lectures in our series. Some weeks ago, Shalini Randeria reported about her fieldwork in India. With that, she highlighted a major problem of public popular approaches. It is common to analyze capitalism with the help of, of concepts, theoretical building blocks, which tend to refer to social entities of enormous scope in space and time. Like, for example, the famous distinction made by Karl Marx between capital and labor is the one social relation defining the capitalist entity as a whole. As I mentioned before, others define capitalism as a huge but nevertheless homogeneous system which seems to include the entire economic world. Another well-used set of such enormous, enormous building blocks is that of the private economy and the state. Shalini Randeria's fieldwork made clear, though, how difficult or rather impossible it is to draw sharp distinctions between such entities in the empirical world. When you dig deeper into the soil of the real, you won't discover clear-cut borders between entities like the private economy and the state. Rather, and on the contrary, you will encompass pretty complex and quite fuzzy webs, networks, or as I and maybe Dave Adaves would put it, complexes of social practices, which as such consist of very different forms of interaction. There are, in short, no well-established borders between different spheres of, social, of the social in the real world, a fact insufficiently incorporated into many theories of capitalism. Our previous discussions supported the conclusion that questioning the building blocks of capitalism necessarily leads to a somehow general reflection of the nature of an end structure of the social building blocks itself. In various ways, the inquiries of this lecture series promote the pro project of taking a closer look at the astonishing diversity of social fabrics which make up the world of human beings. This is, of course, a project that demands a sophisticated social ontology. And thus, we are more than happy that a renowned expert in this field accepted our invitation and will now give his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Elder -Wess. Good evening, and um, thank you, um, Aaron, or Dr. Sar, I'm not sure what I should call you here, um, for that um, very kind introduction. Um, thank you also, um, Professor Knobel and, and the Institute for inviting me to speak to you here. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here, and I hope that I can um, maintain the standard of your previous speakers in the series. Um, perhaps I should begin by saying that, and, and I think this follows nicely from Aaron's introduction, um, that I'm going to talk to you today about the building blocks of our economy and that I don't see that as quite the same thing as talking about the building blocks of capitalism because an important point of what I'm going to be saying today is that the economy that we occupy is much more than simply a capitalist economy. Uh, What I'm going to do today is I'm going to start by saying a little bit about what is wrong with currently dominant ways of thinking about the economy, um, both the kind of neoclassical tradition of economics, but also uh, what we might think of as the dominant um, counter tradition of thinking about the economy, the, the Marxist political economy tradition. Um, 
But I'm not going to say very much about that. I'm going to say just enough to uh, justify and position um, the alternative approach that I want to spend more time talking about. Uh, and there I'm going to focus on, first of all, um, discussing the sheer extent of the economy that exists beyond the market. Um, secondly, the need that that creates for us to think with different kinds of concepts about the economy. And then thirdly, to talk about um, the, the ideas I've started to develop about that alternative way of thinking, which is built upon the concept of um, complexes of appropriative practices. And then finally, I'll illustrate that argument by um, talking you through three uh, applications from the area of the digital economy. Let me begin then by saying a little bit about the problems that I see with our existing ways of thinking about the economy. There, there are very many um, traditions, or very many criticisms, I should say, of the of these two traditions that I've mentioned to you. Um, I want to pick on two in particular. Perhaps the thing that they have in common, the thing which... Um, which I think causes the sorts of problems that, that I'm going to pick on with my alternative account of the economy, is that both traditions can be thought of as wearing blinkers. Blinkers is not, perhaps not a particularly commonly used English word, um, so let me pause to explain it. Blinkers is a, a concept that comes from the uh, horse racing um, field and blinkers are um, they're things that go on horses' faces like this, and they're used because ho some horses have a nasty habit of getting distracted by things over here, which interferes with their ability to get on with the job in hand. Um, and I'm going to suggest that. Both the neoclassical tradition and thinkers in the Marxist tradition tend to look at the economy as if they are wearing blinkers. Let me begin with the, the neoclassical tradition, the mainstream form of economic theory today. Um, there are two respects in which I think it's rather blinkered. One is that it thinks of the economy in monolithic terms. It thinks of the economy as being one kind of economic form. It thinks of the economy as being the market. Um, the market is the only kind of economy that it really has tools to analyze, and everything else is translated into those terms or, on the whole, ignored. So the blinkers allow them to focus only on the market. The second respect in which it's blinkered is that it thinks about the economy almost uh, certainly predominantly dominantly in terms of one mechanism. Their understanding of the economy is entirely shaped by the idea that price is the crucial variable that Price equilibration brought about by competition between optimizing agents is the thing that determines economic outcomes. So only the one mechanism is kept in view. Unfortunately, critical alternatives to the mainstream um, are dominated by another equally blinkered tradition the Marxist tradition of political economy, which, like the mainstream tradition, has um, a monolithic understanding of the nature of the economy. It thinks of the economy as market capitalism. Pretty much the same sort of monolith as the neoclassicals, although obviously the analysis then proceeds in a different direction. But thinkers in the Marxist tradition, again, tend to only see 
capitalism and the market when they're looking at the economy. And like the neoclassical tradition, they tend to think of it in terms of one dominant mechanism, the extraction of surplus value from wage labor. A different single mechanism, but still a single mechanism. So here we have two sets of blinkers. You know, the neoclassicals can really only see the economy in terms of optimizing agents and markets, and Marxists can really only see the economy in terms of capitalists extracting surplus value. Now, while they're quite different traditions in some ways, in, they have two things in common. First of all, that the economy is equated with the market economy, the commodity economy. And secondly, this idea that there is one mechanism that rules that economy. However, I'm going to be arguing that that obscures the diversity of the economy that we actually live in. Now, before I develop that argument, though, I do want to make one other thing clear. And that is that, you know, while I'm going to be arguing that there's much more than capitalism in our economy, that doesn't mean that capitalism is not important. Um, and I'm going to say some things you're quite familiar with, but only really to reassure you that that is also part of the picture. You know, it's absolutely clear that capitalism still does exert enormous power in our current society. Um, clearly, capitalism generates enormous financial resources, and as a consequence of that, it's able to exert massive discursive and political power through its, its predominant influence over the media, um, and through its shaping of discourses that lead to politicians to routinely accept that it's their duty to boost economic performance conceived of as growing the market, which generally corresponds to growing the capitalist economy. So capitalism has enormous social power, um, which has been increasing as a consequence of globalization and, and neoliberal government, producing massively rising inequality um, and a kind of corruption of our culture by purely market values. So really, I'm just trying to make clear that I'm not suggesting that capitalism is unimportant when I go on to say the thing that I want to focus on which is that capitalism is by no means all of our economy today. Alongside the market, there are many non-market forms of economy around us. Um, I have some examples here. Caring work in the household. You know, we clean, we cook, we dress our children, we teach. And we don't sell those services within our families. There's a gift economy in the household. Gift economies don't have to be perfect to be gift economies, by the way. Um, you know, households have internal problems. But that doesn't mean they're not gift economies. Um, in some of the less developed countries of the world, um, non -market, the non-market forms of agriculture are extremely Important In all countries of the world, provision by the state is important. And as I'll come on to say a bit more about later, provision of web content as digital gifts is important. Charity is important. I don't want to um, go into the details now. But I think it's important to point out that this list of non-market forms of economy isn't trivial. It isn't small. It isn't marginal to our economy. There's a tendency to treat it that way, partly because we measure our economy in terms that assume that only the market is important. We measure gross domestic product. We measure national income um, by counting the prices of things that are exchanged in the market. 
And if we measure the economy that way, then we don't see all of the things that are provided outside the market. That does mean it's quite difficult to compare the sizes of the market and the non-market economy. Um, but there are alternative approaches. One approach is to estimate the amount of labour time exerted in the different forms of our economy. And it's, I mean, there has been some interesting work done on that front. It seems pretty clear that even in the so-called advanced economies, the amount of labour time spent, on, um, spent in the household, you know, ignoring the other aspects of the non-market economy, is as large as the amount of labour time spent in the commodity economy. If we add in the other non-market forms, then it's not unreasonable to say that the non-market economy is larger than the market economy. So this is not something trivial and marginal. Um, there, are other, there are also, of course, other forms of um, market economy that don't fit particularly well with the traditional models, but, but I think I've said enough so far to make it clear that economic diversity is important. Um, it's important and it's concealed by the hegemonic ways of thinking about the economy, um, which was, uh, and, and here I have to refer to the work of J.K. Gibson Graham, um, uh, two feminist geographers working under a sort of a joint pseudonym. Um, his uh, wonderful book, The End of Capitalism, um, not the end of capitalism in the usual sense, but uh, the end of capitalism in the sense that um, they were seeing beyond the capitalist economy. They uh, made it very clear that the identification of the economy with the market has become discursively dominant to the point where it obscures our awareness of non-market forms of economy. And what that means is that if we're going to make sense of the full diversity of the economy, we need to start to think of it in different terms. We need to walk away from a conception of the economy that identifies it with the market and only the market. And one way in which we can do that is by thinking of economic activity as what is known as provisioning. Uh, provisioning is a concept that you find in a number of different um, theoretical traditions. Um, feminist economists like Julie Nelson have talked about it. Institutional economists like Kenneth Boulding, uh, realists like Andrew Sayer. Um, and provisioning basically means those activities in which we create goods and services that meet human needs, rather than just those activities that create goods and services that are sold in the market, which is our conventional way of understanding the economy. So I hope I said enough to make clear that um, the diversity of economic forms that surround us is important. That was already true before the internet came along. But the range of economic diversity is perhaps even clearer um, in the new digital economy. Gift-based economic models in particular are significantly more viable in the digital economy than they were in the old economy. If I was in the business of, for example, um, manufacturing these gadgets, then if I wanted to give them away, then for every one that I gave away, I'd have to go out and buy a considerable amount of raw materials. It would be prohibitively expensive to give away thousands or millions or tens of millions of these gadgets. It wouldn't really be economically viable. 
But if I want to give away a page of digital information, then yes, it costs me something to create that page in the first place. But the cost of giving away, instead of giving away one of these, to give away, uh, or one of these rather, <laughs> instead of giving away one of these to give away a million, it's really very small. You know, there's some additional bandwidth costs incurred, um, perhaps if you um, make this big enough, but the marginal cost of producing and distributing more copies of digital products is so small that it's economically feasible to give them away. And the consequence is that gift-based economic models are extremely widespread on the internet. Um, I'm going to talk in a while about uh, Wikipedia as an example of that. Um, I've put peer-to-peer -peer file sharing on here as another. But more profoundly, the vast majority of the web pages that we load into our computers and our smartphones are pages of information that we receive for nothing. You know, the, the basic architecture of the web is to distribute information for free. Now, of course, there are people who try to sell information on the web and some who succeed, and there are people who build other models on top of free pages. But the fundamental of architecture of the web is to share information for free. And in that context, there is no market. There is no value. There is no price equilibration. There is no appropriation of surplus value. And yet people are still working to provide goods and services for other people. So this is part of the provisioning economy, but not part of the market economy. There are also lots of interesting hybrids of gifts and commodity forms, uh, and I'll, say a, I'll talk a bit about Google Search as an example of that in a while. Um, open source software usually appears on the first list rather than the second, but if you want to know why I've put it on the second, you can ask about that later. Um, so, the digital economy gives us another set of reasons for thinking of the world that we live in as a diverse economy. Um, and that means that we need to think about the economy in terms of multiple coexisting economic forms. You know, the older traditions are built around uh, what we might call ontologies of economic form. They may not use those words, but the, the neoclassical mainstream is built around the belief that the only economic form worth considering is the market economy. You know, their ontology of the economy is that it is a market economy. Um, Marxist political economy does a bit better on this front. It actually has an explicit ontology of economic forms. It calls them modes of production. Um, and yet it tends to see every era as overwhelmingly dominated by one mode of production. And in the context that we face, I think we need an ontology of economic form that recognizes multiple different forms. We have to explicitly say that there are multiple economic forms out there coexisting with each other. And we need an economic ontology that is open to that proliferation, not just in the sense that we have identified a few, but in the sense that we recognize that more and more economic forms can come into existence. Um, and that way of thinking leads us to see the economy as a kind of open system influenced by many different mechanisms, none of them necessarily dominating the others and interacting in, in many 
different configurations, which gives us the kind of world that Aaron was talking about earlier, where instead of having you know, neat divisions between different sections of society, we have profuse interaction between them. Now, some of those economic forms are varieties of capitalism, but some of them are not, and we need both in our picture. Now, at one level, then, these different economic forms are the building blocks of our economy. But I also want to suggest that we can take the building blocks metaphor um, a step further and look at each of these economic forms as being constructed from a lower level of block. And that lower level of block is what I call appropriative practices. So I argue in the book that we can explain each economic form as a complex of appropriative practices. Practices, I assume, is a familiar term, you know, a, a, a kind of institutionalized way of doing something. Um, I call these appropriative practices because I think when we're talking about the economy, we're concerned with those practices that influence who gets what out of the process of production. Um, of course, that also depends on what gets produced. Um, so the production and the distribution of benefit. Um, appropriation is a, perhaps a slightly controversial term to use for that in some traditions. Um, but then every other term that I thought of was controversial in, in some other sense too. So I use appropriation here in the sense that these are practices that determine who receives what, who appropriates what, if you like, from the economic process. And my argument is that we can analyze different economic structures in terms of the appropriative practices involved. Not in terms of one appropriative practice, by the way. We're not saying, oh, well, capitalism equals wage labor, for example. We're saying that there's always a set of interacting practices that generate a particular economic form, whether they're market forms, capitalist forms, or not. So that may seem a little abstract so far. So I propose then to try and make it a little bit more concrete by illustrating it with some particular cases from the digital economy. So let me begin then by talking for a few minutes about uh, Wikipedia. Okay, so Wikipedia you're all familiar with. I expect you all use it from time to time. I certainly do. Um, Wikipedia is perhaps the iconic example of the digital gift economy. Um, and it's, it's sustained uh, by three interrelated sets of practices. Of course, there are other practices involved, but I think there are three particularly distinctive and determinative practices, uh, all of which are gift economy practices. Now, first of all, Wikipedia provides us pages of encyclopedic information as a gift. Anyone who chooses to look up information on Wikipedia is welcome to take it for free. That's a, an important practice. You know, it's a product where there is no market, there is no commodity, there is no value, and yet it is still a product that is produced and that provides benefit for its users. So there's the first practice, giving away the product. The second takes us to the space of production, because Wikipedia is also produced on a gift economy basis. It's produced by volunteers. It's produced by um, anyone. Anyone edited Wikipedia, by the way? Okay, I see at least one nodding head. Um, anyone can edit Wikipedia. Um, it's 
It's not that difficult to do. I could show you how. Sometimes I show my students how I get partway through making a ridiculous change and hover the, uh, the, the mouse over the proceed button and then, and then I always chicken out. I've never really changed George Bush from American president to German chancellor, for example. But, uh, <laughs> but I threaten. I threaten to do that. Um, so it's easy to do. Um, it's an, uh, it's an unusual, it's an innovative, it's a, it's a remarkable form of the organization of labor. Because Wikipedia editors are not just volunteers who give their work for nothing, they're volunteers who choose their own tasks. And purely through a process of many hundreds of thousands of people choosing their own tasks, they have constructed the largest and most successful uh, encyclopedia that the world has ever known. There's virtually no hierarchical management. There is a little bit, but not very much. Um, the people who do this work do it because they love doing it, um, or as long as they love doing it. It's a kind of unalienated work. You know, it's, a, it's work where people have control of their own work process. They have control of the product, um, and they work as part of a community. People who get involved in Wikipedia end up um, discussing the changes that they make on the talk pages that sit behind the pages that, that you or I see. Um, and they coordinate their work through a kind of process of debate uh, which is shaped by a set of uh, norms, which are themselves documented on Wikipedia pages, which are edited in just the same way. So this is a gift form of the work practice. So there's a second dimension in which this is a gift economy. The third is that Wikipedia does have costs. Uh, giving away things over the internet is very, very cheap, but it's not free. You need to pay for servers. You need to pay for bandwidth. Um, they, they have a dependence on that interaction with the commodity economy. And those costs are funded by donations. Some of those donations come from corporations, um, but a large part comes from private individuals who give mostly because they feel that they've, they've gained from Wikipedia and, and, and that Wikipedia deserves to be supported. So here we have um, an economic form which is constituted by um, a complex of three appropriative practices, a, a, you know, a product given away as a gift, work donated as a gift, and funding provided as a gift. Producing real benefits that a substantial part of the world's population takes advantage of in a way that neither neoclassical nor Marxist theory can explain, and having a significant impact, by the way, on the capitalist market economy. Um, who buys encyclopedias now? So there's one example. Um, for my second example, I'm going to go to the uh, other extreme um, and look at the case you know, of Apple, perhaps one of the purest cases of the commodity economy. Um, now, Apple, of course, sells its product in a market. You know, here we are in the space of the market and the commodity. Um, And most of the things that I'm going to say about Apple are going to be thoroughly familiar in an empirical kind of sense, but not much of it fits terribly well with the neoclassical or the Marxist ways of thinking about the economy. Apple sells its products in a market, but they don't exactly submit to some kind of competitive logic of the market. What they do is they work constantly to dominate and control 
their markets. They were through a set of interlinked practices. They were innovation, always having something new and exciting to sell to people. Marketing, being the cool stuff that everybody wants. Using technological control to prevent your customers from going elsewhere to make supplementary purchases so that they can only get their music from iTunes. They can only get their apps from the iStore. And using intellectual property rights aggressively to prevent other manufacturers from competing in the same space. So, yes, they're operating in a market, but this is nothing like the competitive markets that neoclassical theory models. Of course, the neoclassicals have got a theory of monopoly, but their theory of monopoly is a theory of what happens after a monopoly has been established. It's not a theory of how monopoly gets established in the first place. And to explain that, we need to look at all of these non-market or, or market influencing practices. Now, what that means is that the market side of the Apple story has a little bit of the neoclassical mechanism at work in there. You know, price competition has a little bit of effect, but it's just one mechanism. Remember, I was talking about blinkers. You know, if we only see you know, Apple selling products in a market, then you're only going to see you know, the price mechanism is what matters here. But when we step back, we can see that the price mechanism is really a, a small part of the Apple story. Now, at the same time, we're also aware that, that Apple doesn't just use its market power to exploit its customers, it also exploits its suppliers and their workers. Um, so companies like Foxconn that actually make the iPhones and, uh, and the other Apple products um, are pretty much at Apple's mercy. Um, and as a consequence, they don't take really much more than uh, the cost of production from the, um, the money that we pay for our iPhones, and they have an interest in exploiting their workers too. So here we have a little bit of the Marxist story. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of um, Chinese workers, paid low wages, living in dreadful conditions, manufacturing Apple's iPhones in China. And yet, can we really explain Apple's profits as surplus value? The price that Foxconn gets for those iPhones when it supplies them to Apple is a small fraction of the price that Apple makes. And the difference is explained by those things up there. So, Again, you know, the, the mechanism that the Marxists see at work in the capitalist market is there, but it's only one part of the story. They do other things as well, of course. They avoid tax and, and so on. Um, but we're going to make sense of even such an iconic case of capitalism as Apple. We need to take account of much more than the core mechanisms that the dominant traditions seek to explain everything in terms of. Okay, I, give, I, I promised you three examples, so here's the third one. Um, Apple's perhaps bet noir uh, is Google. And Google search is an intriguing example of something I mentioned earlier uh, and promised to come back to, and that is forms of gift and commodity hybrid. And here I want to focus on the, the search service that Google provides. Obviously, they give us lots of other free things, um, but the search is, the, is the, the foundation of Google's business. And 
here again we have a, a set of practices. First of all, web search is provided to us as a free service. Um, this is a, it's a kind of gift. Um, remember when I say something is a gift, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, a pure act of uh, unrewarded generosity. If we think about you know, the old stories from Marcel Mauss about gifts, then he says that gifts are, uh, entail an obligation to reciprocate. So in that story about gifts, gifts are, are not a pure act of unrewarded generosity. There's an expectation that something will come back. I don't much like modern usage of most, by the way, because, um, perhaps, sorry, I'm in Germany, I should say mouse, shouldn't I? And, and I was in France last week there, you have to call them most. Marcel Mouse. Um, because I think there are lots of gifts that don't conform to that reciprocity model. And the kind of gifts that Google provides us with are a different kind of gift. They're, they're what I call an inducement gift. They're a gift that is designed to generate a commercial return. They may not always generate a commercial return, just as a, you know, a gift that ought to be reciprocated may not always generate a return. But they are gifts that are intended to produce a benefit for the giver. Um, we might say that they were loaded gifts because they, they kind of carry with them an implicit return. An implicit return is not worth anything yet, by the way. And the return that Google gets for its gift of free search is data. Now, They've made this more and more complicated over the years, but the, the, the basic model is that you type in something that you're interested in. This morning, I typed in walks in Hamburg, and Google gave me back some results about walks in Hamburg. Um, now, of course, in that process, I have provided Google with some data. I have told them that I am interested in walks in Hamburg. And that provides Google with an opportunity. The opportunity to advertise things to me that are connected with the thing that I'm interested in. And, and that is the, um, you know, the holy grail of advertising, of course, you know, in the past. Uh, there was a famous quote that um, an advertiser, um, a marketing manager said, um, I know that half of my expenditure on advertising is wasted, but the trouble is I just don't know which half. And the truth, of course, is that 99% of his or her advertising expenditure was wasted, and they didn't know which 99% because the vast majority of adverts are seen or, or not even seen, but seen and ignored, or seen and no action is taken. Um, whereas advertisers making use of Google service know that the person they're advertising to is interested in something related to the thing that they are selling. And furthermore, they only pay when that person actually clicks on their advert and goes through to their site. So they know that when they spend money on that ad, they are getting value for it, at least the opportunity to sell to a real person. Um, so here we have a model where we've got several things going on. We've got... Um, First practice, search being provided as a free service. Second practice, data being returned as a side effect of invoking search that allows Google to present targeted ads. Third practice, the sale of clicks on those ads to advertisers. 
on the basis of which Google makes a humongous amount of money and is now, I think, the second most highly valued company in the world. So here we have a complex that doesn't really look much like Marxist story of the exploitation of wage labor to extract surplus value. And it doesn't look much like, well, there's a bit that looks like a market, isn't there? There's the bit where Google sells clicks to advertisers. But that piece of Google's business could not exist without the other two parts of Google's business, which are nothing like a neoclassical model of a market. So this is a, a, another complex of appropriative practices, another economic form, which delivers benefits to many of us. Um, many of us who use the service, it benefits to Google who make money from the service, benefits to advertisers who um, get customers through the service, um, but at the same time obviously generates some things that we should be concerned about. Okay, let me wind up then by um, thinking a bit about the implications of what I have been saying. I've talked about the concept of appropriative practices. I have um, illustrated that with three examples. Um, I'm not saying there are only three kinds of complex of appropriative practices in our economy. I'm saying here are three of many, many different complexes. Um, each a complex where different kinds of building blocks are put together in different ways, and our economy as a whole is built from many of these complexes aggregated and interacting with each other. Now this is at best a step towards a different kind of alternative political economy. Uh, a political economy that at the explanatory level has the capacity potentially to explain many different kinds of economic form, not just the capitalist market economy, um, but including the capitalist market economy. But a political economy isn't just an explanatory enterprise. It's also a political enterprise. And here I think there are some advantages to this kind of model as well. Um, political economy is, is necessarily an ethical form of economy. And one of the difficulties with the prevailing traditions is that they have a kind of built-in ethical dogmas. You know, the, the neoclassical model has a kind of built-in endorsement of market capitalism. The Marxist tradition has a kind of built-in rejection of capitalism. The sort of model that I'm advocating is one in which we don't presume that some particular form is negative or positive. Instead, we recognize that we have to judge economic forms by their actual empirical consequences for human beings. We need to evaluate them in terms of the benefits they actually deliver, the harms that they cause, and not just at the level of writing off or glorifying an entire economic system. And that applies to capitalism versus its alternatives, but it also applies to different varieties of alternatives and different varieties of capitalism. Now that produces a political economy with different practical implications. In a way, the neoclassical vision provides us with a political economy, because it is a political economy, of course, um, despite the um, rejection of the term. 
a political economy which offers us only a depressing future in which the market is necessarily universal. And the Marxist model offers us really only an impossible future in which the market is somehow removed overnight and replaced with who knows what. Um, but the sort of political economy that I want us to move towards is one which sees the economy as already diverse and therefore economic, political economic change that shifts that mix progressively as a viable way of changing our society. A kind of um, incremental politics of constraining and eliminating the most harmful forms, which would certainly include some forms of capitalism, but not necessarily all, at the same time as boosting more desirable forms alongside that within the mix. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's an easy vision to deliver. You know, the forces opposed to it would remain formidable. Um, but it's surely more viable than the traditional revolutionary alternative and surely more attractive than the future that we otherwise face today. Thank you.